Um, we're talking today about micro attack simulations to improve the cyber resilience of organizations. My name is Christian Schneider. I'm a freelance security architect, white hat hacker, and trainer, mostly focusing on uh, security architecture, on threat modeling, and penetration testing. Uh, my name is Kevin Ott. I'm a senior red team engineer for Exploit Labs based out of Germany. Uh, yeah, I do mostly red team engagements, a uh, little bit of teaching, uh, some research. And uh, yeah, well, happy to be here today. And I uh, hope you can enjoy our talk. Yep, so do I. Great, so why we're we doing this? Micro tech simulations. What's the idea behind that? It's basically focusing on uh, the gap of early stage organizations. And by early stage, we mean early stage in terms of the cyber security and maturity, especially in terms of uh, resilience to attacks and threat hunting and stuff like that. And why do traditional cybersecurity methods fall short for those early stage organizations? It's most because of uh, either resource constraints, so in terms of uh, staff or budget or both sometimes, so that it's not easy to afford full-scale red team operations on a constant state. Also, uh, possibly a low maturity level in terms of those organizations not having implemented the higher sophisticated security controls that would then be tested by a red team approach. So there will be lots of possibly low-hanging fruits to pick. And sometimes also the lack of well-defined processes in terms of incident response and similar. <coughs> also a skill gap, <coughs> meaning sometimes the lack of uh, in-house expertise to defend or to at least detect certain threats and attacks, and also limited to dealing with the ongoing attacks as well. And of course, sometimes also time. <laughs> sometimes these early stage organizations need to have some kind of quick wins to get the return on invest and also uh, be more on the practical level for that. We found a study by IBM conducted with uh, data based on the Ponemon Institute research and the full link is in the material. And that graph taken from the, the study's result is uh, quite interesting in that perspective. Here we see how organizations rate themselves in terms of cybersecurity maturity levels. And it appears to be a classic 50-50 split between those middle or even lower stage organizations and the other ones. So almost half or sometimes even more than half of the organizations that rate themselves in a more lower stage of maturity, they, well, we assume they do some kind of vulnerability scans though, possibly some kind of focus pen testing as well, but not like those late middle stage organizations possibly do some big picture pen testing, not only focusing on certain spots, also um, doing the assumed breach exercises, but not yet like those um, full blown mature stage organizations focusing also on purple teaming, red teaming as well, of course, and closing the feedback loop on that. So that leads to the famous quote some of you might possibly recognize, that, it's, um, that there are companies that don't really need a full-blown red team, but still want to test the procedures and reactions to certain types of attacks that goes beyond traditional penetration testing. And that's exactly where the micro-attack simulation thing could fit in. It's about um, simulating to uh, um, red teamish style some uh, attacks on certain selected security controls. That means we do have um, a way to have focused, feasible, and actionable, let's name it bite-sized assessments. Some people also refer to this as red team unit tests which are essentially miniaturized and focused red team exercises, targeting only specific single or multiple security controls, and not the full-blown red team uh, picture then, with the purpose of validating these controls and in a quick fashion, and identify gaps even in non-technical domains, but also obviously in terms of technical controls. These could be, for example, firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, or on the non-technical level, policies or incident response playbooks, or the escalation procedures. And applicability is also important. So these organizations, they do have limited resources or limited expertise, and they want to have something that is a possible stepping stone towards a more full and comprehensive red team-like assessment. 
So how can this be implemented? Trying to break specific security controls instead of a full-blown red team approach. Step one would be to create some kind of a tech tree model in order to have the holistic view still, not lacking on that, but then pick certain controls out of that. This is usually done via scenario-driven modeling approaches that can take into account different threat actor personas depending on what you want to simulate. Then you need to create the actual attack simulations or micro-attack simulations, especially for those single point of failure controls. So as opposed to a red team uh, approach, this uh, micro-attack simulation approach does not focus on the finding the controls that are not or not yet implemented, which would be for a classic red team, the low-hanging fruit to pick to get in. No, here in this uh, part, it's more focusing on those controls that are indeed implemented and are those single points of failure in the holistic view of the tree that if they fail, then basically the likelihood of something bad happening uh, increases. So it's to, to find the Achilles heels and especially test those and not focusing on the uh, not implemented controls like some red team assessments do. And also an important distinction due to the micro approach is to stage these test cases. So do you have some kind of stage set up in the production where you have specific to the control that you want to test, obviously, some kind of procedures, some kind of technical tests that you perform that can incorporate, if you need, red team undercover style approaches, depending on whether you want to, to test detective controls or want to test uh, technical controls that do not detect. And it's also important that there's, in this scenario approach, then no need to penetrate from the outside towards the specific object you'd like to test. It's still possible to do this if you need, but the idea is to be more focused and targeted to the controls you would like to test. At the end, you need to execute these attack simulations in a ordered, useful fashion to get some kind of results. So to test whether the outcome of the tests are either preventing access, the desired outcomes, or stopping an attack, or triggering incident detection, or even incident response processes. And as said, this, if it's a detective control that needs to be tested, can also incorporate undercover techniques, silent techniques that are usually used in red team approaches as well. Yeah, so which controls to attack? <laughs> How can we identify these? That's usually via scenario-driven attack tree modeling, as said. And for that, the first step would be to define the threat actors you'd like to see in your model. So the personas that are possibly attacking you, it's useful to get, to get different scenarios out of the attack tree and then get to the controls you'd like to test using micro-attack simulations. Here in uh, likelihood <laughs> of occurrence ordered, you see some uh, typical threat actors, but you can place in this modeling approach uh, them with any kind of threat actor, even being nation state if you want, if that's part of your model, um, that you would like to have this tested with. Then you define in the model approach, first step of the micro attack simulations, the attack goals. That's essentially what attackers could achieve or what you think they, they would want to achieve and what's the impact of this to your organization. That's to get some kind of prioritization out of the model on which controls you should focus first, especially those that might hinder or prevent attackers from reaching the more high impact attack goals. Then here, just a, a zoomed out view <laughs> for an attack goal you see that in a graph-based attack tree approach, you can model and or, on, and or, or connect it, the nodes of how these steps can be achieved. So on the left side, we see the attack goal. On the right, we see the leaves. The leaves are the first entry steps, the vectors by certain uh, threat actors. And there you see some, some color-coded uh, higher likelihoods or higher risky paths as opposed to some less ones. We can zoom in on one of that, for example, here how to, in a ransomware uh, scenario, uh, uh, how to get the step horizontal spreading, which is essentially the end connection of an infection distribution and a prolonged, meaning undetected, internal spreading. And that can be achieved via different sub-nodes. And then in order to determine the likelihood of these paths from happening, you need to assign the actor and complexity levels to the leaves 
which then bubbles up in the tree until you get some uh, likelihood calculated of those more likelihood uh, happening paths or those that are less likely to happen. So if it's a more um, frequently observed threat actor and a more less complex attack for that, that would be obviously a more higher likelihood as opposed to a less uh, frequently observed threat actor and a higher complexity for that. At the end, we want to test or simulate attacks on, thereby test, controls. And that means we need to have some security controls in the tree. So that basically means we need to apply those to the nodes. And those nodes, uh, depending on where on the levels in the tree they are, then they get either more generic security controls, if they are more closely to the, to the root or attack goal, or if it's more towards the leaves, it's a more specific security control. And a security control does have some effects that when it is implemented, it essentially helps in reducing that this risk, basically, that this step is uh, manifesting in the attack path. And some do have a high or some do have medium or lower kinds of effects. That's helpful to get in a simulation approach to the control combinations of what are those weak points that you would like to pick for the microtech simulations. Also, that leads to the fact that we need to get some instruction sets. We can zoom in on, on something here of a validation of how we can try to execute the attack. So that's basically like a cooking recipe for a pen tester or a, a red team member, a red team engineer, to execute the microtech simulation on that particular control. So that essentially makes it repeatable. So even if you are exchanging the team members for example, different skill sets, you have some kind of um, um, repeatable and defined validation steps for each control. And at the end, we want to find those controls that if we break them in the microtech simulations, we get the highest result from an attacker's perspective. So we need to find the Achilles heels, the single points of failure. And that's those controls that when they are implemented, get, uh, when they then are broken, <laughs> that get then the highest outcome for the attacker. And that means we need first to identify which control is implemented and which not. So marking those controls in an, a scenario-driven approach as implemented where you know that you, or you assume as an organization that you have implemented that, that then basically brings the effect to life of that control on the desired node. On the other side, this allows us to get those controls that are not implemented, that are already in the model approach stated as not implemented, out of the view for the microtech simulation. Because where you know already that something is missing, this need, doesn't need to be tested like in a full red team approach it would be. It's an obvious outcome. Yes, and at the end, this basically uses then some, some kind of, or brings us to use some kind of simulation technique like Monte Carlo simulations or other simulations to get to those combinations of implemented controls that when we break them, meaning in a microtech simulation, we find or prove that they are not really implemented as they should, essentially failing them, that we then have the highest impact from an attacker's perspective of an attack path being way more likely. So these so-called Achilles heels or single points of failure can then be in a very easy statistical way be calculated. And if you want, you can also mark them in the attack tree uh, that where those controls are applied so that you get to see where the paths would open up to get a higher risk if your microtech simulation manages to break those. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look at an abstract uh, let's take a look at an abstract view of one of these attack trees. Um, so what we're going to do next is we are going to choose the path that we want to take during our simulation um, throughout the attack graph. And one thing that is very particular with these micro-attack simulations is that we don't do a full-blown red team assessment. We don't start by breaching the perimeter. We don't start by sending phishing emails because that's not in scope either because we want to test a different control or because, for example, the organization doesn't have any specific controls against these kind of attacks, 
So why should we test something where we know that there are no controls to defend against um, this kind of attacks? So what we can do is we can just skip some of these steps throughout the check uh, tree in the beginning or in the end um, because there are no controls for that. And we don't need to put any effort into breaking into the, uh, into the perimeter, which with the increasing um, spread of things like Office, for, uh, Office uh, 365, Defender for Office, is becoming increasingly uh, difficult. So we want to focus really on these few controls that we pick out along the path um, that we determined in our attack tree. So how do these micro attack simulations look like? And one of the um, most common examples, and I guess best examples, because we see that in a lot of pen tests, we see that in a lot of red teaming engagements, is abuse of Active Directory misconfigurations. So when we have companies that do red teaming or pen testing, and they do it on a yearly basis, they do it every two years, you have the issue that in between your tests, there are a vast variety of vulnerabilities coming out, new misconfiguration that can be easily abused. So with the microtech simulation, we have the objective to assess individual vulnerabilities or individual misconfigurations uh, throughout the microtech simulation with the objective to compromise the Active Directory or parts of the Active Directory. And also, and because we can choose which kind of controls we want to target, for example, we can also test the effectiveness of a privileged access management solution if it's possible to bypass um, uh, these controls. So with the objective, we want to have uh, a set of controls that we want to now validate or uh, break in our microtech simulation. And uh, for this case, it would be something like the AD security settings, as obvious control, the best practices analyzer for Microsoft, or tools like Pincastle as a control, and we can validate if the results were, for example, used correctly, and also privileged access management tools and their sensitivity. So would it be possible to bypass or break the assumptions of the privileged access management tools? And a micro tech simulation, um, in this case, for example, would encompass a single vulnerability, um, like the ESC1 vulnerability from uh, the Spectrops paper on uh, ADCS abuses, which I guess the red teamers and pen testers and maybe threat hunters here are uh, familiar with, but uh, which allows us to uh, basically forge certificates with a different account and then use those forged certificates to authenticate against the Active Directory. And if we use the domain admin account, then we escalate it from a low priv user to the domain admin, given the conditions for this vulnerability are met. And as a uh, domain admin, we can now then see if what happens if we just add a user, like a normal, um, a, a normal low priv user to the group of, um, of, of server admins, is this detected, or can I even go ahead and bypass the PAM solution by just accessing the uh, server directly instead of going over the uh, PAM solution? Then the next one, um, also uh, one that I like very much, is covert communication channels. So the objective would be to test and evaluate if an organization is able to catch malware that is operating over covert channels like WebSockets, which is not commonly seen in C2 traffic. Most uh, C2 frameworks are based on either uh, beaconing or long polling. Um, not so much have been, or I don't know if too much that are communicating over WebSockets. Um, DNS, I mean, yes, Cobalt Strike supports it, but um, it's still one of these channels that is not, in, not monitored enough in, in a lot of environments. So what controls do we have that we are able to test using this micro tech simulations? We have our network intrusion detection systems, uh, application layer firewalls, and DNS monitoring tools on the network level. We also have endpoint protection, um, so EDRs, EPPs, um, uh, endpoint protection programs, um, or antivirus solution, classical antivirus solution on the endpoint level that we can try and see if we can break these security controls. And so, the actual micro tech simulation would be running a RAD or a C2, be it either a custom one, uh, off the shelf, Cobalt Strike, customized, and see if the controls work. Does the endpoint security solution detect the C2 implant? Does the network intrusion detection detect the beaconing 
of the DNS or the uh, WebSocket communication with, for example, um, non-reputable non domains. Um, so this would be one of the, uh, another microtech simulation. Then the third example is something that is probably recent every time you talk about security, because if you open yesterday's newspaper, there's probably something about incident, uh, ransomware somewhere. Um, so the objective would be to test the ability to detect and contain, especially contain, um, custom-built ransomware that is spreading throughout the network, encrypting data en masse. And for this, we also have controls like endpoint security, um, endpoint detection and response. Um, the market is more or less, or there are more and more uh, solutions in the market that specifically target ransomware um, attacks by detecting, for example, file changes, entropy changes on the file system, and uh, those go a bit along with the heuristic analysis tools that more and more companies implement to detect and stop ransomware. So what are we going to do in our microtech simulation? We are going to run a ransomware. Because we're not, I mean, we're not going to run a live ransomware because the risk would be hard to mitigate. Um, there are still some, there might still be residue of uh, malicious code. We can't control everything. So what we do is basically write a uh, ransomware that does encryption um, while preserving the headers of the files on selected endpoints um, so that we can simulate the malware um, moving laterally to other servers and also in certain timed intervals so that we can go ahead and simulate the spreading of the files so that we can simulate that the malware or the ransomware travels from one system and infecting uh, more systems throughout the network. So why do, why do we preserve the headers? Um, a lot of these tools that detect ransomware work based on entropy. So if there's a lot of encryption going on in a system triggered by a single file or triggered by a uh, single um, executable, um, then there might be flags for suspicious or malicious activity. And if we preserve the header, a zip file will still look like a zip file, just like it's a corrupted zip file. So hopefully, um, I haven't tested this against too many solutions, but hopefully tricking the solution into assuming that this was not an, an encrypted file in place, but that there was just something breaking and not triggering a suspicious or malicious um, alert. And then the last one, and this one was most of the, or one of the most fun micro attack simulations, is actually testing the uh, crisis management of an organization and that we want to test if the proce uh, processes and procedures related to incident response and incident management are working as intended and not just on paper. So we have ransomware emails that we send to the target organization and a lot of activity that should be detected throughout our microtech simulations. And the controls that we have are the crisis management procedures, um, incident detect, uh, detection and the alerting mechanism. But all, that also goes hand in hand so that things not only get alerted but also acted on. And the microtech simulation is basically tied to the uh, microtech simulation before where we run the ransomware and then we start dropping ransom notes and also uh, trigger a lot of high severity or critical severity alert by um, um, intentionally so that we try to actively start the incident response process and the uh, crisis management process because there uh, are indicators that the whole network is started to being encrypted and there, there's an active spreading ransomware in the network. And especially in these ransom notes or ransom emails, we also include proof of breach. Uh, we include indicators of compromise to show them that we are in the network, to show them that we have control like normal ransomware groups do it as well. Okay, so now we have these four microtech simulations. So during the case study, um, what we do now is we tie those together into an attack path that if you remember the, the abstract graph that I showed before, where we have now a certain part of our graph that we start to simulate in an exercise. And so we did exactly this, and this is where also this talk comes from. Um, we did exactly one of these microtech simulations for a large financial organizations with uh, multiple entities in, in different countries. 
uh, what we did is we ran this ransomware simulation on the German entity um, of that financial organization. And we had a few parties that were involved. Um, we had a white team um, that consisted mostly of people from crisis management that were also the, um, the people that triggered the, the, uh, the exercise and wanted to do this exercise. Of course, we have the blue team, SOC incident response, as, as one of the parties. Uh, we have the data protection officer, because what we did is actually send ransomware emails or ransom emails to the data protection office, uh, officer, where we got the uh, contact from the public information. And then we have the external red team that does the actual execution of the ransomware exercise. So looking at how we did the setup of, of, our, um, of our microtech simulation is, so we were provided with access to a VPN client and to simulate like an active compromise. We didn't use the client itself, but instead we used a Chisel or a custom version of Chisel to compromise the client and establish a SOX channel uh, to the client so that we can do everything we need to do over the SOX client and do not touch the VPN client with a C2, um, especially with Cobalt Strike being more or less the baseline for endpoint detection respo and response tools at the moment. Um, we didn't want to make it too obvious, um, but also wanted to have, at least at some point, a way to, to trigger some detections and, and make it more obvious that there's something going on in the network just to see if we can trigger any incident response, uh, incident response in the process. Uh, then we did also have a second endpoint used for outbound DNS C2 traffic that we used on the server that we wanted to encrypt as a backup channel should the incident response uh, detect and uh, quarantine our laptop that we always have a channel back in using outbound DNS as a C2 channel. And then we accessed the VPN client, uh, the, uh, the server from the VPN client, and therefore we had our full infection chain. So what we're going to do now is we walk through the timeline of our case study, and for that I did some color coding along the uh, individual events of our, um, of our timeline. And so for the blue ones, we basically just have informational events that, don't, should, uh, that should not trigger any, um, any incident response or any reaction from the client. And then for each event, we have uh, color coded if the event was detected and an investigation was started, the event was detected, but no investigation was started, or we didn't have any detection uh, or investigation at all for certain types of events. So we started in the morning. Um, we, the first thing we did was just run Cobalt Strike through a loader. And the endpoint, the, uh, the, the endpoint protection program, uh, antivirus, actually uh, caught the Cobalt Strike beacon through network indicators. Um, so that's why we have this yellow little bubble there. <laughs> Uh, we had a technical detection um, in the activity logs of the AV. You could clearly see that it was marked as Cobalt Strike being executed on an endpoint, uh, but there was no investigation triggered at all. So it just flew by the SOC, and no one bothered into looking into that certain incident. Um, so we said, OK, let's not use Cobalt Strike as we intended to. Let's use Chisel. So at 9.45, we established a Chisel tunnel, and as you see, it's red. So there were no detections by the endpoint detection and response. There were no events thrown by the AV, and there were no events thrown on the network at all. So we had a covert communication channel established. We had a SOC channel, and now we were able to tunnel all our tools through this uh, channel without having like a real C2 on the, on the endpoint. So what we, uh, what we did then is just to see if the SOC would react if we do some things. So we started throwing around tools through the network. We started port scans. We started uh, burp scans. Um, we ran, uh, 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 yeah, basically uh, all sorts of commands and um, tools that are often used and often seen in ransomware um, incidents. Um, we ran an AD enumeration, like full AD enumer enumeration uh, through the SOX proxy. And interestingly enough, the AV actually caught a lot of these events um, by their network detection engine and through 15, 20 alerts. And even though we now had a system with multiple critical alerts, there was no investigation. No incident triggered, no investigation. It just, nothing happened. We were able to maintain our control. We didn't see any response and we were in contact with the white team and they said basically there's nothing. No one is saying anything, there's no response. So, 
we said, okay, then let's try to attack the server and start encrypting things. Maybe that helps. Um, so we had an issue that the target server was not accessible. So we needed an alternative plan to get access to these servers. So we talked to the uh, white team, our proof of concept, and said, okay, let's just check the AD and what happens. So we executed AD enumeration. Um, the time between was mostly spent with lunch and importing large files into uh, Bloodhound. And so that at 1.15, we had something critical that we could use to escalate our, our privileges in the Active Directory. But as this was not initially part of the scope, we said, okay, let's uh, talk to the white team. They discussed a bit internally and came to the conclusion that it's a good idea, just run the attack. So that at 3.30, we run the, ran the ESC1 attack, uh, escalating us to domain admin. And as you can see, the bubble is red. So we were domain admin, but there was no detection, no incidents, uh, no incident response, nothing. Uh, the white team confirmed that there was no active investigation going on, and no one basically noticed anything. Um, so what we did next is we took it to the next level. We said, okay, let's test their pump solution because we noticed that it was not as easy. They were using uh, a common pump solution. Um, so we just added our user to a group that had admin privileges on all the servers, which was not noticed at all. So we could add our user. And now we were able at 345 to actually access our target server. And from there, execute our ransomware. So um, again, this was one of the points where we uh, had to be a bit careful to not do any business interruptions. So what we did is uh, write a custom ransomware that instead of deleting the files, just moved them into a different directory. Um, after the encryption was, has taken place, um, we were using Salsa20 as the encryption algorithm to simulate uh, popular ransomware groups like Lockbit. And we were also using the same um, file format and file extensions as Lockbit normally uses to simulate that, oh, this is indeed Lockbit encrypting all everything on the server. Um, to not do any business interruption, we just encrypted the C users file, which limits, of course, during an investigation, the impact because the C users file on servers is often just used for temporary storage and not really used for sensitive information or critical information. Um, but that was just to not interrupt the, uh, the business. Um, and also, after encrypting everything, we ran our custom DNS C2 agent on the server just to have a backup channel in case something happens to our laptop and we still maintain access to the server. And as you can see, also, neither the ransomware nor the custom C2 using DNS was detected and no investigation was started on the server. So what do you do? I mean, in the end, we're a ransomware group. We want our money. So we sent a ransom note. We basically registered an email address using ProtonMail, called it Lockbit Ransom 4, and then just started sending emails to the uh, data protection office of our target organization and uh, asked for, I think it was $40,000 because the guys from the white team said that uh, below $50,000, uh, they didn't have anyone to have sign up, so someone receiving this could just sign off on the ransom. So we said, okay, let's try it. Uh, we provided an actual working Bitcoin address. We even told them how to get the Bitcoin. Um, and we tried to move from there. So what happened next? We needed to send a second email that showed that we actually had domain admin access and that we actually are able to control everything in the network because there was still no reaction. Like they didn't go, they get, didn't go into full incident response mode. They didn't believe it was real. Um, but after the second one where we increased the amount to uh, 70,000 euros, and told them that we have full control over the Active Directory, 15 minutes later, they actually went into incident response mode and opened an active investigation into the incident after the crisis management teams actively triggered the incident responders that maybe they should start looking into these kind of incidents and maybe they should take it seriously. So after 10 minutes of the investigation, we got feedback from the white team that the IR team doubts that the threat is real and that they do not believe that we actually have access to the domain, although we send screenshots and everything, but yeah. So that's what they said. I think they realized we had access because um, they actually tried to uh, track us for a time. They weren't able to fully track what kind of groups we have compromised. At some point, apparently, they did. 
because at uh, 6 p.m. they actually tried to disable the domain admin account that we had, but in the meantime we compromised the second account, so we basically just re-enabled the first one um, and had still full access over the, um, the complete domain. And when we talked about, or when I talked about the micro tech simulations, one of the controls and one of the um, things you can also test is, are they able to trace an active incident back to the source? And apparently they weren't because throughout all this, we still had full access to the laptop using Chisel and no one started quarantining our laptop. And there was basically no real um, containment of the attack. So at 6.20 we decided, okay, uh, we noticed that they tried to stop us, so let's tell them that this is not really helpful. Um, so we basically sent them a third email, this is the last email, that they cannot try to stop us and that uh, sent them screenshots that we're just re-enabling the domain admin account every time they try to disable it and yeah, uh, I guess the, the reaction of the stock should have been pretty funny. We didn't really see it, but um, someone must have gotten panicked when they saw that the account just gets re-enabled uh, re after they tried to disable it. So then at 6.45, the white team decided to resolve and close the exercise because it was just short of uh, completely escalating, including local law enforcement uh, being called. So we said, okay, let's call it quits. Let's resolve, this, uh, let's resolve the exercise and uh, start with the debriefing and the post-mortem analysis. So, post-mortem analysis. Yeah, pretty much this. Um, so, we were in constant contact with the white team throughout the exercise, and they basically, every time we asked them, like, do you see anything? They were like, nope, nothing happening, no incident, no one cares. Um, but what I really liked, especially about the white team, is they never saw this exercise as a failure. They never, they never said once, like, we failed. They said, and this is very important for one of these exercises, everything is an, um, is an opportunity to learn and improve those processes. And I think this is one of the most important outcomes because they were very happy with the outcome because now they had something tangible in hand to go to their management, get the management attention and tell them, okay, we need to improve our processes. They work on paper, but once a real incident hits, nothing worked. No investigation was triggered. They were ignored, and um, if this was a real incident or a real ransomware, the whole network would probably encrypt it by the time that they started the investigation. So um, yeah, they had some valuable lessons learned. So last step for us was basically just to go over the logs that the white team provided to us, do a side-by-side -side analysis, look at what controls worked, what controls didn't work, and then go back to the attack tree that Christian showed before update the controls, update the attack tree with the controls that we broke, and then recalculate the, the risk of the whole um, organization towards these kind of attacks and uh, uh, towards these kind of, for example, ransomware attacks, and then basically close the loop and give the client a nice view of what didn't work and how to improve their controls in the long run. Yeah, so um, basically, Coming to a conclusion for that is comparing the um, micro tech simulation approach with traditional red teaming approach, which is also very useful, of course, but in different scenarios. So both have their benefits and drawbacks, but different ones. So obvious one, the scope. Micro tech simulations, they are more focused on specific controls that are to be elaborated from the attack tree. And the traditional red teaming approach is, of course, more broad, covering more attack vectors. Same goes for the derivation, also an obvious one. So we pulled this off in one day, uh, so from beginning to end at the customer, so at least the active part, which means the duration is uh, way shorter than a full-blown red team approach. That correlates also obviously to the cost and uh, resource requirements, and also a little bit to the complexity because there's less planning required. You can adjust in between as we did when we were not able to directly penetrate the server or get access to that in a state stage scenario that would be useful. And so we basically then um, readjusted the scenario in real time to go towards the active directory and use that. And that would require more extensive planning and more complex uh, procedures on the red team approach side. Regarding the skills, 
Uh, it may vary, so some specific controls may need very specific skills to micro tech simulate them. But definitely you need to have a bunch of very um, diverse skills in the red team approach and that requires possibly to cover more areas. And also there are different objectives that these two approaches follow. So the first of the micro attack simulations is to validate specific security controls picked from the attack tree. And the other one obviously validates the overall security posture more looking from the outside. What do they miss? So the microtech simulations obviously miss some interrelated operations of security controls because you're testing them in an isolated or in a, in a less combination of isolated controls. Just a few controls in a combination as we showed you with those four we pulled into the uh, event. Whereas the traditional red team approach um, tries to um, reach in usually from more an outside view and that might then possibly miss weak points behind that posture, so if it's not penetratable. Meaning, if the red team would not be able to get access to the servers that should be encrypted, then basically the outcome would be uh, of less value because you wouldn't get to see those uh, uh, missing alerting and incident response procedures uh, results as we did when we then got access to the server. Impact on ops in production is usually less, it's less disruptive, giving you less risk. And, but also it's less <laughs> realistic in terms of simulating real world attacks because it's a more staged scenario, micro attack scenario, and um, whereas a traditional light team approach obviously tries to be more real world like. The output also is a little bit different, so you get a detailed feedback on the specific controls and my personal key takeaway from that execution was that it's interesting to see how huge the uh, crisis management gaps could be in an organization. So when you really put the SOC under pressure, so in the post-mortem analysis we identified that there were enough indicators that should have been caught, should have been seen in the SOC and some were, some were not and uh, at least the, the full-blown incident response mode kicked way too late in. That's an interesting uh, feedback from that. Reporting is therefore more focused and, and straightforward, but can be also enhanced with the tree. That's what the closing of the feedback loop meant, so to get still the holistic view of the overall picture by then zooming out in the tree and just updating those controls which basically failed during the assessment. Then they do no longer uh, have their effect of protection. And at the end, the adaptability is also a huge difference between those two approaches. So the um, micro tech simulations are easier to adapt, meaning to other threat actors, different personas. So like, for example, um, professional attacker group inside, ongoing APT, or compromised employee, evil admin, whatever you, you consider a, a valid uh, threat actor in your scenarios. Uh, and also it can be easier to adapt that for different controls or it can still be easier to simply repeat it and see whether you improved or not. So that might require more significant changes uh, for each iteration in the traditional red teaming approach. So when you take a look at the offensive security landscape, where does micro tech simulation then fit in? Where do they fit in? We do have vulnerability scans on that side. Then we do have the classic vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. We do have red teaming and of course purple teaming. And roughly speaking, micro tech simulations fit into that space. Depending on where you put your bias in, well, that's basically where we see that this fits in that scale. Also, it's possible to simulate the unsimulatable. <laughs> so, uh, that's one of the uh, more interesting benefits also of micro tech simulation approaches. And for example, code backdooring. Uh, here we have got two news uh, that uh, made it uh, recently or more or less recently into the news. You get the links in the uh, material here. Uh, the left one is a um, code backdooring that happened in the user agent parser node module, NPM, and was pulled by many companies. If I recall correctly, even Facebook, I think, pulled that in. And it's essentially a remote code execution in production then. And another one is a very interesting article we found on the web about a uh, study, some, some uh, idea of uh, having VS Code extensions maliciously backdoored. And this was very nice to read that kind of uh, 
blog post about the results because that gives you an impression of how easy it is for a developer having an IDE and pulling in some kind of uh, pretty fire or, or dark mode, um, uh, color coding, whatever uh, extensions in their IDE, what we all love. <laughs> and uh, they basically created a, a raw copy of that and put some, um, at least out of band trigger, that something got installed. And that would allow them to do code backdooring as well. And it was quite frequently installed. So these two things is an example of that it's easy to simulate in a microtech simulation something where a red team approach would fail on simulating that. Because in a microtech simulation, you could simply plant a deliberately desired backdoor, backdoor uh, module in some kind of local registry of artifacts and see if the incident response team manages to get the supply chain attack trace back to the root, or even detects it, or does not. So closing on this, um, why opt for microtech simulations? What are the gains and advantages? One is to get a more rapid validation, quick turnaround for the security controls that you tested, giving you direct insights. You can very well tailor it. That is in the modeling phase, where you can tailor the attack tree, and get to different attack scenarios based on different threat actors that you want to pull into your model, and have a flexibility to scale this when you need, without losing the holistic view, still maintaining that. So having the outcome of the simulation plus the tree, you can then simply update those controls that you essentially broke during the execution of the micro attack simulation to a failed state, and then recalculate the attack tree to get still the end-to-end -end view of the overall risk of what uh, high impact uh, attack goal could possibly still be reached now. Giving you actionable feedback, so you can then prioritize and uh, try to focus on those things that the microtech simulations prove that were not correctly implemented. And at the end, hopefully, a little bit of more cost efficient than full head red team approaches, so because it's less resource intensive and then basically a little bit quicker as well. So that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you for listening to us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our talk. We are still here for some questions and answers. And yeah, so from our side, thank you. And feel free to ask any questions. So I actually have two questions that are mostly uh, regarding the planning phase. You showed that execution was, in this case, one day. How much in relation to that is spent on the setup yep. and also if you have especially clients that are not that mature yet won't the answer be regarding a lot of controls that they are just not existing both is true uh, uh, definitely um, good question first one regarding the planning phase it depends on where you, you start in terms of does that company have at least some kind of uh, threat models some kind of assessment of their, their attack goals and the attack paths. Uh, most, at that maturity level, organizations that we are speaking about do not. So that needs to be taken into account. And uh, that's more a threat modeling kind of thing. Uh, at least one day, I would say, as it, <laughs> definitely, uh, as an effort. And um, the other one is preparing the actual simulations. That means creating some kind of individual ransomware that encrypts something like we did in that kind of scenario, or coding an individual uh, DNS out of band uh, thing and testing those. That's something that you, as a red team executing group, uh, have somewhere prepared for your arsenal. So you do it only one time and adjust a little bit. And the other one is to actually get access to things and prepare indicators that you want to place into the system. So we need access to the target infrastructure, basically, up front with a white team in a covered, uh, otherwise not uh, communicated path. That's um, varying on the controls that you need to assess, basically. So at the end, it was not too many days. So I would say it, it's been more weeks in terms of just having a few appointments and some, some delays in between, big companies. Big companies. And, uh, but in the overall amount of um, days, I would say it would roughly fit in one week. The other question, um, even less mature uh, organizations, uh, isn't it the case that then security controls are mostly unimplemented? 
I would say yes. <laughs> so that's even the benefit of the microtech simulations that you see in the attack tree phase already, that you do have so many open things that you don't even need to execute these simulations because in the model you see already that there are many things missing you should have implemented. So go for these first and then in the second iteration do the actual assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you.